being an entrepreneur, very honestly, uh, I'm very bad at that because I have always looked at the creative side of every business that I started. In advertising, when I started, I was very honest about this, that I don't know much about business. I don't have that kind of business sense. So I had partners who knew, had the business sense. So I think the first key to being a good entrepreneur is to know what your weaknesses are. You shouldn't go with the feeling that I know everything and I can handle everything. You can't. So the point being that I only took care of the creative aspect of the agency. The business aspect was taken care of by others, which is why it worked very well. We started our agency in uh, 91 and uh, we had fantastic local clients. We had Indian clients who were very good. We had Amul, we had the entire Parley Agro, we launched Fruity, Appy, Bailey Water, we had Goodnight and Hit and we had Bank of India and State Bank and Exim Bank and, and we had this thing that the whole world was going global and we had this thing that we don't have to worry because we have all these fantastic clients so we don't have to look at any tie-up with any agency. And then we start, started realizing that our clients were selling out to international companies. One fine morning, Transelectra, which was a good night company, was sold to Godrej, who then sold part of it to Sara Lee. And we suddenly realized that what is happening is, we may find that we have Indian clients, but Indian clients are not remaining Indian. And we had to look at some sort of a tie-up. And we tied up with what was that time the third largest agency in the world called Publicis. It's a French agency. And I think you brought that agency into India as a managing director? The fastest link up anybody could have with a foreign company. I still remember we were talking to some people and we realized that if we had to talk to a foreign collaborator, we appointed people who were experts in doing that. And they came and said uh, what he called in accounting terms, he said it's called the dressing up the bride. That you have to do your account so well that it looks like a great thing that you've done for the last five years and we were doing all that. I got a fax, that time there were no mobile, I mean there were mobile phones but there were no, internet wasn't so active. From this gentleman who was the Asia Pacific chairman of Publicis, a Frenchman stationed in Singapore and he said, look, uh, we are interested in linking up with you. Can you come down to Paris, myself, my partner and a finance guy because we didn't understand finance. We went to Paris. And I still remember we went in for a meeting, Maurice Levy, who was the chairman, still the chairman of Publicis, walked into the room and we, were, we had carried a whole presentation about our agency. And we were doing all this and this gentleman, Maurice Levy, walked in and said, uh, so he said, do you understand anything about finance? And I said, no. Then he said, then why are you sitting in this meeting? Why don't you come with me and I'll show you around the agency. And I went with him. My people sat behind and they finished that entire collaboration by the evening. The next morning, we signed a, a contract with them and we became Publicis Zen in the next one day's time. And I asked him, I said, how was that possible? And Maurice Levy very honestly told me, he said, Bharat, we are French Jews. We know our business. We know how to deal. We are buying agencies world over. We are linking up with agencies in every country on this planet. We know that when we start and start negotiating, you'll ask for 10 we'll offer you five and we'll settle for seven. So that's a formula we go by. We all know that you'll ask for more and we'll offer you less, knowing that we'll finally settle midway. He's saying what I like to do is, I like to come and meet people to find out if I like the people I want to work with. He said, when I walked in there and when I said, do you understand finance if you don't come with me, that's a sign to my people that I like these guys. I wouldn't mind working with them. Otherwise, I wouldn't take you around to show my agency. Then financial things don't matter because it's a question of negotiations. But if I didn't like you people, this deal wouldn't have gone through no matter how financially attractive it was. But he said that was a signal to my, the top finance guy, the CFO. So I think business is not just about how your money part synchronizes. It's how you're dealing with people that you can get along with because that's the long-term way of looking at this. And I think this is the way they've grown that they have bought into people, they have not bought into furniture and, and uh, account books. So I think any business that deals with people and buys into people has a great chance of success. Uh, Bharat, we are all entrepreneurs here where we know the importance of branding, marketing and advertising. What we would like to know from you is, what is the difference and what is the similarity between branding, marketing and advertising? See, advertising is just a small part of marketing. Advertising is not 
there's a wrong notion that people feel we have to be creative in advertising. Advertising has to sell a product. Advertising doesn't have to win awards. If you win awards because you've done something good, it's fine. Like for Amul Bhatta, we used to win an award every year. But Amul had an 80% market share. It still has an 80% market share. So Amul could do the kinds of thing it did because of two reasons. One is a great product. Good advertising can't sell a bad product. You can make a consumer buy it once. You can't make it buy it a second time. Here was a man who came and said, I know nothing about advertising. I know all about milk and milk products. I don't understand advertising, so don't come and show me what you do. Do whatever you want to do. I won't ask you any questions. Can you believe a client who was putting in good money behind a, a product? I, I mean, I'll give you an example. Why did Amul become so popular? Because it was topical. Every hoarding that went up wasn't brilliant, but it was very topical. And how could it be topical? I'll give you an example. If there was a, a Wimbledon final happening on a Sunday, and if there was McEnroe and Bog playing in that finals, I would do one hoarding on McEnroe and one on Bog. Give it to a hoarding contractor and say, whitewash the hoarding, put a scaffolding up. At night, 10 o'clock, you call me up. And if McEnroe had one, I would tell him, ek number ka hoarding lagao. And he would start painting that hoarding at 10 o'clock. Next morning, if you were driving to office, in your morning paper, you would read that McEnroe had one. And there would be a Amul Bhatta hoarding with a joke on McEnroe. Now, that wouldn't have been possible if there was a client to meet on a Monday morning and show this to. And Dr. Kurian said, do what you want to do. Fantastic, fantastic. Oh. Lovely strategy. But the point is, everybody has a point of view about advertising. About engineering, they may not have. You never argue with a doctor. You don't argue with an engineer. But with an advertising agency, every Tom, Dick and Harry has a point of view. And I, on my email, if I ever send you an email, I have a thing written which says, Camel is a horse designed by a committee. committee. <laughs> you know, if a committee sits down to des design a horse, then everybody has a point of view. Somebody says, let's make his legs a little longer. You know, somebody says, let's give him a hump so he can hold on to him. So that it's easier to sit on him. At the end of it, you don't get a horse, you get a camel. Advertising is a small part of marketing, but that has to be left alone to people. You know, you can have a team that guides the agency. But if you don't interfere too much with the creative, you get great campaigns. And that's how you sell products. Nowadays, advertising replaces ideas with film stars. And they're all called... They're all called brand ambassadors. <laughs> Calling them brand ambassadors is a misnomer. They're models, they're not brand ambassadors. You know, brand ambassador is somebody who lives the values of a brand. I launched Amul's uh, health drink, like Bone Vita, it was called Nutramul, years ago. And we used Dara Singh as a brand ambassador, as a model. Because we had done a survey and found that in every, whether it was South, East, North, West, Dara Singh was this icon of fitness and health. So using Dara Singh for Nutramul, you could have called him a brand ambassador. A film star is supposed to be because they are known all over India and they are better actors than models. They can add value to what you are doing, but you have to have an idea first. They can enhance an idea. They can replace an idea. And I think a lot of advertising goes wrong because ideas are being replaced by either either uh, film stars or scantily clad women. You know? So advertising is about ideas. And the best thing advertising has to keep in mind, and I think all of you in every business, you have to keep in mind is, who are you selling your products to? In advertising, we call them target groups, which means that who's your target group? You must know whether you are selling an advertising campaign or you're selling a product or you are just come in, in any communication you must know who the person on the other side of the table is Bharat what would you prefer as an ideal situation as an entrepreneur you choosing clients or clients choosing you and what happens most of the times in advertising I can only speak from my experience which is advertising uh, clients choose us we don't have a choice See, advertising agencies don't choose clients. We go, clients normally call 20 agencies to make presentation and then and pick one that they feel is the best. Now, agencies can contribute that way. We can advise clients on what is good for them. And if the clients are wise and they treat the agencies as their partners and not just suppliers, which I think every company must do to no matter who your suppliers are because they're experts in their own business. You must treat your suppliers as partners because then that gives them a feeling of ownership. 
if you keep treating all your suppliers and all the people that you deal with as just suppliers, then it's a money relationship. You pay them, they supply. But if you make them feel that they are a part of this business, they come up with some fantastic ideas. You have suppliers who come up with the kinds of suggestions that you could never get from your own company. So, advertising agencies contribute in these ways. We've done that. As an entrepreneur who's into the advertising business, how do you handle your own competition with fellow uh, advertising agencies? You are constantly fighting to not just get an account, but retain an account. Because for big clients, I mean, if we had Amul, or if we had Tata's, or if we had Parley's, these were fantastic blue chip accounts. And every agency in town wanted to work on those. So they would keep on approaching these clients and saying, we have a better idea than what you're doing right now. And the client would say, okay, show me, because it's, finally he wants to improve his own business. And we had to complete, con constantly be one step ahead of the competition, which meant that we had to constantly think more innovative, more creative ideas, which is what is, I think, stressful in advertising. Uh, Bharat, what, what I would like to ask you is, in any creative industry as an entrepreneur, the worst threat is not somebody taking your client. The worst threat is somebody taking away your most creative person, which is called as poaching. So how do you do poaching for your agency? And how do you avoid your people being poached? In advertising, that has been, uh, like in every other field, I guess, that's been one uh, major problem. Because uh, the moment you are good, you are known. When we go to an ad club awards function, you see who, which agency is winning the awards. You know who are the guys who are writing those ads. So you people come and say, we'll give you huge salary jump or we'll give you a better designation. And it becomes difficult. I mean, there are people, once you are all happy together, working together, like in Zen, we had uh, uh, all the people that we had, I don't think we had any people leaving Zen and working elsewhere. Till we became publicists and we became a bigger agency. The Zen lot remained very loyal. We all worked together. But I think the bigger threat for most businesses is not poaching by other competitors. It's not knowing who your competition is. I think in recent times, most companies that have gone wrong have gone wrong because they didn't know where to look for their competitors. I mean, there are some shining examples. I remember Sony launched the world's first uh, Walkman. They were the innovators of that and they started. And they were looking at Sharp and Panasonic and who were their competitors. And whatever Sharp was doing or Panasonic, Sony was watching them carefully and doing something better. They never looked at a company called Apple because that was not their competition. Apple was a computer company. They never realized that one day Apple could come up with an iPod and wipe out Walkman from the business. They were not even looking at Apple. So all these businesses have gone wrong, not because they were doing something wrong. They were not looking at the, they didn't know where the competition is coming from. Today, it's not like a boxing match where you are looking at your competitor. Today, I think business is like a billiards table. You don't know which ball is being hit where and where it's going to take and deflect and come and hit you from which side. So not knowing who your competition is the biggest fear for every business. Since you're in the service industry, what according to you is a good pattern of client servicing? In advertising, I tell all my people that the best way to retain a client or get a client is that you must know more about the client's business than the client does. You are not just a chap who's going and selling a, a layout to a client. The client must get the feeling that you know as much about his business, you know as much about his suppliers, as much about his product as he does. That's the best way of getting a client and that's the best way of retaining a client.